Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we continue our special report focused on isolation and stress on the farm. Then a slight detour in southern gardening where we focus on what some call a star flower, a real butterfly magnet. In the markets, Zach dives into what's making this month's supply and demand report tick. Then back to our special report concluding this episode with a glimmer of hope. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. This week, as we edge closer to the end of the year, we continue our theme of mental health on the farm and continue our series focusing on stress and isolation in agriculture. In this story, we meet Nathan Casburn of Sumner, Mississippi. His story is all too familiar and made possible through the extraordinary efforts of producer James Parker and MSU Films. Mississippi Delta, specifically Sumner. The farm is roughly 1,500 acres, give or take. This year we're primarily soybeans. Been a family farm since early 1900s. Family house. My dad and I work together. As of this year, it is just the two of us. How do two people possibly work 1,500 acres? <laughs> Slowly, difficultly, and uh, painstakingly. We get it done, though. This is not what I want to be doing. But it wouldn't be a normal day on a farm if you didn't have an unexpected fire to have to put out. That's just the name of the game. Farming's a very tough life. You know, you have a lot of risks that you have going in, and people don't think about that. You know, people don't think about how one storm can completely wipe your crop out and you know, put you back to square one. Or, and really, you know, no fault of your own. I think a lot of people think that it's just easy. You just put stuff in the ground and then just go count your money in the fall. They see a lot of numbers that people like, people like to spout off statistics, but you don't see all the overhead behind it and everything like that. You don't see the, the work that goes into it. You don't see 10, 12 hours in the sun. You know, you don't see stuff constantly breaking down that's out of your control. And then part suppliers being out of control uh, COVID coming in, a, a global pandemic coming in and shutting down supply lines of parts and making parts availability impossible. At the end of the day, you, you're never, you, there's never enough hours in the day to do what you want to do. But you do what you can and wake up the next day and start over. It can be extremely stressful. It's really not what I expected to be part of my life forever. I didn't, I didn't intend to farm. I kind of felt like I didn't belong and I didn't want to be here. 
but things don't always work out like we plan. 2004, I was a junior in high school and I had been drinking. You know, a lot of folks around here start drinking early. The Delta's a drinking culture, it just is. We had a car wreck. My girlfriend at the time was driving on the back road. She was pretty badly injured. I, I wasn't as badly injured, but I still broke my back in a couple spots and I was given a couple prescriptions of, of painkillers. I remember sitting, on, sitting in the chair, there's a recliner at the house, and I felt like I was floating. And I was like, this is the greatest feeling ever. I want this to last forever. And I, I was gonna do whatever I could to make that last forever. Usually it starts where people are using for a reason other than the original intended consequence. And with that, that's where you can easily have it spiral out of control because then it starts becoming that coping mechanism. And the more you do that, the more you rely on any substance for your coping, the less able you're gonna be able to naturally cope. And so it's really a catch-22. They were cheap. $20 would get you whatever you wanted, you know, and that's, I realized that I could just go spend 100 bucks and be good for the week. But then that, that $100 is only good for three days. Then it's only good for one day. Then you make that jump to heroin. It just escalates and it's out of your control whether or not you realize it. You keep trying to keep that control over it, keep that grasp on it, but you can't. A heartbreaking story, but Nathan Casburn's journey is one that led to a better ending than most. We'll have the conclusion of that story for you later in the show. On the lighter side, once again, a flower with real star power. This week in Southern Gardening, the Pinta, a flower that's great for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies. Bottom line, in the landscape, it's an economical, easy to care for plant that's a whole new way of saying, give me five. As the host of Southern Gardening, I love getting to promote great plants for our gardens and landscapes. Today I'm in Poplarville looking at a series of plants that have really performed well this year. Treated as an annual here in our area, pintas are perfect for our summer and fall weather. The name pintas comes from Latin, which means five, because each of its small flowers have five petals that resemble colorful stars. As a matter of fact, pintas are also known as Egyptian star clusters. These flowers bloom in clusters from spring until fall frost. You can expect up to 20 clusters of flowers on one plant at any given time, adding a vibrant splash of color to your garden. In addition to their beauty, pintas are also an attraction for butterflies and other pollinators. The butterfly series of pintas is one of my favorites. Butterfly white pinta features classic white blooms that resemble bright stars. Butterfly orchid pinta is a variety that features striking blooms that are typically a shade of pink or light purple color. Butterfly deep rose is another stunning variety that showcases deep, dark pink flowers with light pink eyes. Lastly, Butterfly LT Lavender Penta is a beautiful plant that produces clusters of lavender-colored flowers. Its unique color makes it a standout addition to any garden. Like other pentas, it also attracts beneficial insects and provides a rich nectar source summer through fall. Be sure to deadhead as this will promote more flowering color throughout the year. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but please stay with us. Coming up, more of our series critically important to agriculture, stress and isolation on the farm. 
In the conclusion of part one, more from Nathan Casburn, told in his own words, we come to understand how and why the opioid crisis has disproportionately impacted rural communities across America. Three of every four farmers and farm workers have been affected. In Nathan's story, though, there's a glimmer of hope. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Quite a few things going on. Yep, that's right, Mike. We've got the WASD report plus a few other things going on in the markets. But first, the numbers. We'll take a look at last week's biggest gains and losses, and then we get into the details of this month's WASD report. And finally, livestock. What's making moves in that sector? So, markets closed last week a bit on the upswing. Grains all up while livestock a mixed bag. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, lumber, up $13, over a 2.5% rise from the previous week. Last week's biggest loss, lean hogs, down nearly 4 cents, an over 5% decrease from the previous week. Moving on to this month's WASDE report, the biggest takeaways have to do with production and supplies being down due to weather conditions, specifically dry weather. Looks like it's not just affected us here in the U.S. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat supplies up due to higher production, uses up due to increased feed and residual use. Season average farm price $7.30 per bushel. Global wheat supplies down due to lower production in Australia, Kazakhstan, and Ethiopia, mostly due to dry conditions. Global trade and consumption down slightly. U.S. corn production and supplies are down, along with feed and residual use. As a result, exports also down. Season average farm price $4.95 per bushel. Global corn production up, especially for Argentina, Moldova, the EU, and Paraguay. However, global corn stocks down slightly. U.S. rice supplies and production down, exports forecast slightly up due to higher shipments to Mexico and Central America. Season average farm price, $16.80 per hundred weight. Global rice production mostly unchanged, trade up due to increased imports to Indonesia, exports up due to increases in Cambodia and Vietnam. U.S. soybean production and supplies down due to lower yields, exports down as well due to competition from South America. However, crush, meal exports, and soybean oil exports up. Season average farm price, $12.90 per bushel. Global soybean exports and imports lowered. Crush increased, ending stocks down mostly due to lower stocks in China, Brazil, and India. U.S. red meat and poultry mixed with higher beef and pork production and lower broiler and turkey production. Cattle and pork prices forecast lower. U.S. milk production forecast slightly up due to higher milk per cow. Butter exports raised while cheese exports lowered. 2023 all milk price forecast $20.70 per hundred weight. 
U.S. cotton production down due to lower yields in Texas, offsetting gains elsewhere. As a result, exports and ending stocks down. Season average farm price, 80 cents per pound. Global cotton production up as larger crops in Brazil, Argentina, and Tanzania offset smaller crops in the U.S., Australia, and Greece. Consumption and trade mostly unchanged. In this week's Row Report, we again hear from MSU Extension Row Crop Economist Will Maples. I sat down with him and asked about the issues driving prices, and his answer had to do with current season and helps give us a bird's eye view of the situation. So really this time of year, we're just seeing, seeing a lot of the seasonality we normally see in row crop markets. You know, coming through the summertime when you're trying to get a handle on how much production is out there, what's yield going to be. So that's when we saw prices run up so high there in July is when, you know, the drought concerns with the crop, trying to nail down yields. As we're starting to harvest, it's looking like a little bit better year. You start seeing prices come down. So harvest time is traditionally the lowest time for any grain prices in the country just because that's when all the supply is coming in and there's not, you know, there's supplies greater than demand at this time of year. So a lot of it's just the seasonality and just the crops looking better than we initially thought coming through the summertime. That makes sense because I remember we reporting earlier in the year that the crops because of the ongoing drought we're not looking so good, but now as the seasons progressed and people have gone on crop tours, they've come to realize that these crops really are looking better than we expected and therefore the yield's going to be greater. Yes, so I mean yields are going to be off from what we initially thought, you know, coming into the year, but still a lot better than we had thought coming into the summertime with the drought. You know, really it's a testament to this, the genetics of these plants now that you can have such a tough growing year and still yield good. In the livestock markets, a bit of activity last week, both cattle and hog in a liquidation stage, which means that the packers are buying. That means prices will reflect the situation. However, according to analyst Don Rose, the buying signals potential higher prices come next year. Well, you know, the thing about the feeder cattle, I mean, the numbers just aren't there. I think it was pretty impressive that the feeder cattle went up with the corn going up. Um, so I think we have a floor there just from the numbers. And I don't think it's so much that. I think it's what happens to the corn and then what happens with those defer hedgeable opportunities. Um, and those are work in progress. It's going to be tough for April cattle next year to go over 200. We tried and it's just a tough number, I think. Well, the hog market's in a huge liquidation. I mean, the packer's making about $32 a head. The uh, vertical hog integrator's losing about $20 a head. Um, we've been in this massive liquidation, and eventually the liquidation should translate to higher prices next year, but the government says about 85 for all of next year. We're substantially higher than that, but um, December hogs running a $12 discount to the uh, cash right now. It's normally on par, so up front's a little cheap. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Weather the big thing right now. However, despite the situation, we still have ample stocks for now. Mike? Thanks, Zach. And now the conclusion of Nathan Casburn's story. A farmer in Sumner, Mississippi, an injury led to his dependence on drugs. For many, it would be the start of a downward spiral, but Nathan had an epiphany and found a path toward recovery. I would, I would show up work hungover. I would show up withdrawn. Well, I, I don't ever think I knew that I was withdrawing at the time, but I would, I would show up. One thing I would do is I would show up no matter how miserable I felt. I'd be two hours of sleep hungover, but I would still be at work. And I would use that as an incentive. If I work a few hours, you know, I can start drinking or I got this coming in at this time and I can go ahead and do this and I'll be better. It, it wasn't for years that it got to the point that it was causing me issues with work, which that came, but for years it didn't. And withdrawal symptoms are almost always the exact opposite of whatever the drug does. So something that makes you feel happy and good will actually make you feel sad and depressed coming off of it. And the way to take those away is to take more of the substance. So as people go on, you actually start using the substance just to feel normal. You know, not even to feel better, just to feel normal. I'm overdosing at least once a day, and I've got a, I'm, I teach a buddy of mine how to do CPR because it's gotten to that point. What I'm doing, I've isolated myself so much that it's just me and the drugs, and it's the point where I'm either going to get clean or I'm going to die.
I kind of have a, I don't know if you call it existential moment, but it was kind of an out of body moment where I sucked out of my own system and I was able to kind of see everything for the truth of how it is. I was stuck in this pattern. Get high, sit on the couch. And I, I, I couldn't, I physically couldn't go beyond that. I was supposed to have been at work and I couldn't do, I couldn't do anything about it. And I wasn't even enjoying it. No matter how much I didn't want to do it, I couldn't stop myself from doing it. And I just had this moment where I, was, I saw, uh, I just saw it for how it was. I just saw that I was going through the same thing and I was, I was stuck. I was never gonna move beyond where I was currently. I wasn't, I wasn't going to go anywhere. Everyone else around me was going to, was moving on. And I was going to be right here. And for how long I was going to be right there, I didn't know. It was a very sudden, this is how life is. And it's not going to get any better unless you do something about it moment. Once you hit that moment and once you, you know, really get that, get to that spot where you're open to change, where you realize that there has to be change. Now, that's a life-changing moment. It's that fork in the road where it's, it's forcing you to make a choice. And you realize that status quo only leads one place. And you have to decide if that's, if that's where you want to go or not. You know, are you going to the grave? Or are you going to build up and get out of this? I cut my phone off because, and I left it at the house because I knew that if I had my phone with me, I was going to call somebody to bring me something or go get something. I finished out the work day and dove head first into recovery. And that was fall of two, late October 2016 and that's what I've been doing ever since. Afterwards, what it looked like for me is working on relationships with people I work with, which include family, my dad and I, you know, it's, it's, we've gotten a lot closer because our relationship, we hardly had a relationship. If I'd been him, I would have fired me and run me off and I would have deserved every bit of it because I was extremely hard to be around, extremely hard to deal with, but he never did. And I appreciate that and I've appreciated the last couple years because I've been present for it. It's been really good for work and everything else because it's allowed me to learn so much and to grow in my knowledge of farm work and be able to become a better farmer. Take over a lot of the responsibility that I've been able to and actually step up and do what I'm supposed to do. You know what I mean? This year in particular has been probably the hardest year of my life, but it's also been the most rewarding year of my life. I've accomplished a lot, but you have to work at that and it doesn't come overnight. It's been a process over the last three and a half years. It's, you know, may have been bad choices, may have been bad, bad circumstances, but however you got there, in a way it doesn't matter. It's about what you do going forward. And ultimately that's how we mar leave our mark on the world, right? It's, it's what we do. It's not really even where we've been. Sometimes actually the greatest stories start from the worst places. Well, beforehand, it was just a job. There was something that I had to do because I had to have money and to support my habit. And if I didn't show up, then I got fired. I was, that, that was as invested in it as I, was, as I ever was. I, didn't, I never really looked at it for what it was. I wasn't capable of looking at it for what it was. And now it's a lifestyle as well as a profession that's not a job. The biggest hurdle is being able to say, I can't do this on my own, and I need, I, need, I need help with this. And that is the most terrifying, difficult thing to do. But once you get past that, and you realize it's not so hard to do, then a lot of other stuff is doable. And once you've made that transition, you can pretty much do anything, including getting clean, staying that way. Very important, if you or someone you know is an emotional crisis, call or text 988 anytime for confidential, free crisis support. 
Well, next week, farm stress. Again, farmers know all about it, and if you're not one, you'll understand a whole lot more when you see this story. Edward Jenkins drives a tractor and knows what it takes to make a living in the Mississippi Delta. He also knows that mistakes put farmers out of business. It's a hard way of life. He says his first 20 years he quit 19 times. On the farm, our series continues. That's next time on Farm Week. Before we go, a yearly tradition that always brings a smile, 4-H Day at the Mississippi State Fair. Recently, it gave youth the chance to enjoy the midway and to compete. 4-Hers showed livestock, programmed robotics, had an omelet showdown, and more. DeSoto County 4-Her Emma Wofford tells us about life with Benjamin, her five-year-old commercial rabbit. It's a commitment, but it's definitely worth it. Like, it's so fun. Like, just getting to show. He's been a pet of mine for years before I even entered this contest. And so it's like you get to grow with him and teach him and do things with your animal that you might not get to do otherwise. And it's just, it's good experience. And it feels good to be able to do this. So. That looked really fun and cute. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.